Hop, hop, hop. Hey, Claudia. Well, it's about time for us to get underway. We so appreciate each and every soul that's with us this morning for our Bible class time here in the auditorium. Um, certainly those that are able to be with us in person, but we're also uh, mindful that there are still those that uh, uh, feel more secure um, at home um, and a few that are taking advantage of our gym worship uh, for at-risk individuals and they're streaming with us online. We're thankful for that technology. We pray there'll be a time in the near future where most everybody can be back with us uh, to provide uh, encouragement to one another and uh, to uh, have great fellowship with one another. But we are pleased that you are with us this morning. Um, without embarrassing anybody, we're happy to have Kip and Karen Henry back with us. They've been gone a couple of weeks due to some illness in their family. Uh, we're also pleased to have uh, Bobby and Marvin back with us who've had a bout of COVID the last few weeks. Um, I'm very pleased to see Don Finley who has not been here for quite some time with a number of different ailments. It's great to see him back in his uh, usual spot. We're just pleased to have those that can be with us here with us this morning. Um, I wanted to uh, mention a few things before we <clears throat> have our prayer. Um, just updates, Tommy Smith as well as Bert Seaborn are both uh, at home. So uh, continue to keep them in your prayers, but they are both at home. Uh, David Dill um, has been told he needs to have a triple bypass and uh, as of last Sunday evening, I guess that's when I last talked with him, they had not yet gotten it scheduled. But that's uh, what I know about David. He is gonna have to undergo uh, bypass surgery. Uh, they believe triple bypass surgery, but they uh, have not gotten it scheduled yet. Uh, we mentioned this, I think, last week the week before, it's also been in the bulletin, um, but 
please, please be aware of uh, a new ministry uh, that uh, is kicking off um, in earnest this coming Tuesday uh, for our um, widows and widowers of the congregation. Uh, Joan Little uh, is going to uh, act as the uh, coordinator um, and she's the contact person uh, for this um, uh, widows and widower uh, ministry. Um, they're going to get together for the first time this coming Tuesday, this next Tuesday, uh, the 19th, at 6 p.m. Uh, in the small auditorium, correct? Small auditorium? Yep. And uh, they'll go from there. They, have, they don't know exactly how often they'll meet or what days they'll meet, but it's going to be this Tuesday for the first one. If you're alone, a widow or widower, um, this will be a wonderful opportunity for you to connect with some folks here at church. Uh, they've got some, a number of different kinds of activities planned, uh, and um, from this meeting, they'll uh, flesh out their, uh, their uh, activities. But please try to be there if you can. If you have any questions about participating in this ministry and what this ministry is going to be all about, you can see uh, Joan Little uh, and ask her about that. I hope you'll take advantage of that. Those are the announcements that I have this morning. We are going to be, uh, of course, studying once again uh, the, uh, the life and the activities of Jesus during his public ministry. And uh, both uh, today and, Lord willing, next Sunday, we're going to look at two uh, very, very well-known incidents uh, during his public ministry um, uh, and uh, discuss those. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Father God, we come humbly before you this morning. Father, we pray that our minds are focused upon you, learning more about you, praising you. Father, we thank you for giving us a measure of health to be here. We thank you for the opportunity that your word affords us to know more about you and your will for us. We pray that as we look into your word this morning, both in class and later in worship, that we will take what we learn and make a proper application in our lives so that we might please you and present you to others. Father, we thank you for the progress that's been made by Tommy and by Bert and the fact that they have been able to go home. We pray for continued strength for them. And we pray, Father, for David and Janice as he awaits his heart surgery, and we just pray for a good outcome there according to your will. Father, we ask a, a special blessing for our widows and widowers and for this new program, this new ministry. We pray for its success. We pray that this will bring a number of our members <clears throat> even closer together and give them an opportunity for renewed spiritual growth and wonderful fellowship with one another. Please forgive us, Father, when we fail you, and with each day that you give us, may we try to be more and more like your son, Jesus. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Now, uh, I didn't mention this, but I think most everybody knows by now we have uh, handouts both on that communion table and that communion table. 
I'm not going to uh, spend a lot of time in description because um, I think most everybody here uh, is of an age that they can remember Paul Harvey. Uh, but on the off chance there's some here that don't, he was a radio commentator primarily but also wrote a column for a lot of years. Uh, and he had a, uh, uh, a saying, a catchphrase that he used a lot called uh, the rest of the story. Typically he would tell a story or write about a, an incident and uh, you would think on the surface that what you saw was what you got and then he would say, and now for the rest of the story and then of course go to commercial and sell something. But when it came back and you heard the rest of the story, typically with Paul Harvey, his rest of the story uh, was generally very uplifting, usually somewhat ironic. There was something uh, that really caught your uh, attention uh, and made you think. Uh, and he was just enormously popular for decades. Uh, well, uh, today and next week, we're going to borrow his catchphrase. Uh, this week, uh, this lesson is rest of the story, part one. And next week, again, Lord willing, uh, we will look at rest of the story, part two. And as I mentioned earlier, these are both um, incidents in the public ministry of Jesus that are well, well known uh, probably to most of you. Um, we're going to be, of course, today in Luke 15. I'm, I'm assuming uh, most, if not all of you, did your, your reading. Um, and it's uh, in Luke 15, of course, where Jesus is uh, pointing his remarks uh, towards the Pharisees, the sect of the Pharisees, who have been extremely critical of Jesus and have done whatever they can do to disrupt his ministry and have called him um, a friend um, and one who uh, consorts with sinners. Um, and uh, Jesus um, uses uh, the device of a parable that is a, uh, an earthly story uh, with a spiritual or heavenly point to make. Uh, he uses parables very effectively uh, to turn that criticism that he's receiving from the Pharisee sect uh, back upon them. Um, I've always been fascinated by, uh, frankly, what I think of as maybe the very first parable of the Bible uh, it may not be, but to me it is in the Old Testament when Nathan came to David and told him the story of the uh, couple of people that had sheep. Uh, and uh, uh, really the story was about the rich guy taking the one precious lamb from, from the other fellow who wasn't so wealthy um, and leaving him with nothing. And uh, David... Uh, got incensed when he heard that story. Uh, he said, well, the nerve of that guy to take that sheep. Who is that guy? He heard the story and it caught his attention and it made his emotions such that he wanted to know who that guy was. And of course we know Nathan said, you're that guy. The use of a parable can be very, very effective because oftentimes we'll read the parable and we'll think it's about somebody else. And truly it's about perhaps us. And in this case he was used in these parables. In Luke 15, the lost uh, coin, um, the lost sheep, and the lost son uh, to criticize the Pharisees for their attitudes. Uh, their attitudes of being uh, self-righteous, um, their attitudes of uh, being self-centered uh, and their attitudes of uh, uh, not looking at 
each and every person is important. And of course, we know with God that is not the case. Uh, just to uh, digress one moment about the Pharisee sect, as you can read in your handout, it was uh, really the most doctrinally influential sect of Judaism uh, during the time of Jesus. Uh, now on the good side um, of the ledger for them, they were, um, by their very name, uh, which denotes separation uh, from the world, they were made up of many well-meaning, uh, religiously uh, zealous uh, Jews uh, who wanted uh, to, to strictly adhere uh, to God's uh, law and God's word. However, by the time of Jesus' public ministry, um, they had degenerated into a sect dominated by their own um, human opinions and traditions uh, in such a way that uh, really they had just become again um, uh, a shell of their former selves. They were, they were more interested in their own importance. Um, they felt that they were the only righteous people around and they um, had uh, gained a lot of power and influence uh, and wanted to protect that as best they could. Uh, they shared some of the beliefs of Jesus, of course, but uh, um, they also had uh, a lot of disdain for the Roman authorities, uh, which they would put aside, uh, as we know, uh, with a common goal of getting, getting Jesus. But their hatred of Jesus uh, blinded them to what God in the flesh was all about. They hated Jesus so badly they could not see, literally, uh, the forest for the trees. In the lost son parable, which I think we're all familiar with, one of the, I think, one of the uh, most uh, meaningful parables that Jesus uh, uh, talked about, we've got three characters, essentially, three main characters. We've got the father in the parable, which um, is, in essence, God. Uh, we've got the younger brother, uh, who's a wayward, who's, who's, who's uh, a wayward sinner, uh, who uh, turns his back on his father, but ultimately does repent. And, and we had uh, a great lesson last Sunday about repentance. It's not just simply being sorry for what you've done, um, but it's uh, wanting to change, to make a change, and uh, get away from those things that hurt God and make God sad and try to do your best to do those things that make God happy. And then finally we have the older brother. The, the, the father had two sons, the younger one that uh, went to a far place and, and uh, squandered his inheritance uh, but repented and came back. Then we have the older son. The older son uh, uh, is really the essence of the rest of the story today. Oftentimes we'll talk about the uh, parable of the prodigal son or the lost son. And what first comes to your mind is that young son that left and lived a life of debauchery. That's the lost son uh, to, to, your, to your mind's eye, first of all. But really the parable of the lost son is in essence, about this older brother. It was intended, it was intended to once again uh, be a sharp rebu rebuke in the way of a parable to the Pharisees for their self-righteousness, their smugness religiously, their uh, insensitivity uh, to people who were struggling with sin and who, in overcoming it, were turning to God. Uh, this older son, of course, uh, was lost even though he never left home. That's why we think of the younger son, I think, as the lost son. He left home, went away, was the prodigal. The older one never left home. He had uh, always been uh, faithfully working for his dad in the fields, on their farm. Probably worked hard. He lived a good, clean, moral life. But 
he would remain lost, though he never left home, until he could conquer his prideful self-righteousness. And in essence, Jesus is saying the Pharisees and those that have in their heart those thoughts will forever be lost unless they can get past their prideful self-righteousness. Well, I've divided this up, as you see on your uh, handout, into four sections. Uh, we're going to really look at the... Um, Verses following verse 25 the most, but uh, just to set things up and refresh our memories. There was this request, and that's shown in verse 11 and the first part of verse 12. And that's when the younger son came to his father and asked him for his share of the estate. He was ready to leave. He had had enough of that life. He wanted a different life away from his dad. Um, think of this as you and I, at some point in our life, making the decision that, uh, you know, we've got it pretty good, but we, uh, we don't need our Father anymore, our Heavenly Father. We turn our back on God. We decide that we know what's best. Uh, everything's going well, and so uh, I'll make it even better without God's help. Then there's the response to that request, which we see in the uh, second part of verse 12. And simply put, the father honors his son's free will and grants the request, provides him with his share of the state and, lets him, and says, all the best to you. Now, perhaps the father tried to talk the son out of leaving. We're not told that in Scripture. But I think the point is, God has given us free will. We are not uh, automatons. We're not robots. Uh, because that kind of obedience would be meaningless to God if we were. God wants genuine love, respect, and obedience not something that's uh, automated or robotic. So, we have free will. Um, God blesses us with good health, good looks, well, maybe not, but good luck, you know, good fortune, but at the same time, free will, where we might take everything that we have as something that we have earned on our own, and deserve on our own. And may, we may turn our back on God and decide to go our own way, do our own thing, indulge in those things that make us happy, and not put God first, not worry about what makes God happy, what makes us happy, what makes us feel good. And that's what the younger uh, son did. And then what was the results of that. He wanted his half of the inheritance and wanted to leave. Uh, his dad's control, his dad gave him what he wanted and said adios, and the son, he squanders it all. That's the first result. He lives a life of debauchery. He, he, he squanders it on loose living far away from home. He got as far away from his dad, I guess, as he possibly could. And he got to the point where he had absolutely nothing. Uh, he didn't have any material goods to speak of, and he didn't have much promise of a future to speak of. He was working literally as a servant, a hired hand, the lowliest of lowly professions, to the point where in the scriptures, uh, in the story, uh, describes him looking enviously at the uh, pods that were, seed pods that were being fed to the pigs. So that was the first result. And I don't know the timetable on that, but he took what he had, what was his, he left, and he squandered it all. 
and found himself broke, busted, uh, desolate, without, without much prospect. But there was a second result which is uh, wonderful. And the second result, um, he came to his senses. He, he realized, using the brain that God had given him, he realized that he had made a mistake. His decision was wrong. And, and he wanted to change his life. Now, as Jerry mentioned last week, he could have said, my decision was wrong, and I think I'll kill myself. Or my decision was wrong, but so be it. I'll, I'll, I'll forge ahead and find some way on my own to get ahead. No, he realized that he should have never left his father. And he, he wanted to return to his father. And that's repentance. He had to change his life. His life was going one direction, and he wanted it to go in a better direction, in the right direction. And so uh, here is a, a sinner, a sinner who's wandered away from God, but who repents, who realizes what he had done was wrong, um, but also realized he needed to make a change, a significant change, and get right with his father. So he decided to return and ask for his father's forgiveness. Uh, that's found in verses 17 through 19. And that brings us to the, to the section, I think, that, that really drives home this parable and, is, and encompasses in it the rest of the story. Uh, oftentimes our mind sort of stops upon this younger son returning home. And uh, we'll look and see what happens here. Uh, so, so the reactions uh, to what has taken place, the son asking for his half the inheritance, the father granting that, the son leaving, blowing that money, blowing everything he had on uh, a real sinful lifestyle, getting to a point of being completely broke, uh, both physically broke probably and uh, mentally, emotionally uh, broke and discouraged, and then coming to his senses and deciding uh, to change his life for the better, return to his father and beg for his father's forgiveness. That's where we're at as we start uh, this last portion of, of, uh, of this story. Uh, the first react we're going to look at three reactions. Um, the first reaction was that of, the father, who uh, we can tell in reading the scriptures probably was always keeping his eye peeled to the horizon. Uh, I, I can imagine his father praying every day for his son to uh, change his life, for his son to come back. I don't know how many of you... Um, or like me, we have people we love, family members, friends, um, even sometimes acquaintances, that we pray every day uh, that they, too, will come back, that they will change their lives, uh, that they will make um, that important decision to trust in God and try to make Him happy. And I think of that about the father. Well, the father was so overjoyed when his son came back that the father ran to meet him, as it says in verse 20. It wasn't that the son came and had to look around for the father. The father was looking for him, praying for him. And when he saw him in the distance coming, he ran to him. He ran to the son and embraced him showered him with affection, was overjoyed uh, with his return. And as, as the son confessed his failures, his, his father ordered a huge celebration to be held in the honor 
of this lost son who now had returned, or in essence had been found. The son was truly repentant. He didn't even come back wanting to be truly the son. He just came back saying, hey, I'll, I'll work as a hired hand for you. I just want to be around you. He was humbly repentant. The father reinstated him as a, as a full son. There was no hired hand thing about it. This is my son who was lost and now he's found. So he ordered the huge celebration. And then we see the second reaction. It prompted the older son, the stable son, the son that had never left home, the son that had worked for his father all of those years faithfully, who had lived a good, clean, moral, upright life. He had been out in the fields working, as he always was. He was an industrious, working kind of guy. So as he came in, he uh, had heard the commotion, inquired what had happened, and the servant explained to him that his younger brother had returned, and a party to celebrate that fact had been ordered by his father to be organized. And that's when we truly see the reaction, the second reaction. The first had been the joy of the father at the return of this son. Now we see how the older son reacted in verses 28, 29, and 30. And we know from these verses that while he had served his father faithfully for years, had been a very stable person and lived a clean moral life. However, now he had gone truly into his own distant country, even though he hadn't left home. It was a distant country of sin because within verses 28, 29, and 30, we can also see him for what he held in his heart. Let's read those verses, starting with verse 29. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. Well, we see in just those two verses a person who um, is self-righteous, who's judgmental, unforgiving, Self-centered, has little concern for anybody other than himself, angry and rude to his father, unappreciative, complainer, very harsh and envious in his attitude, and who seems to be generally a troublemaker, a pessimist. And a joy killer. Again, keep in mind, he's talking to his father who has just welcomed back the son that had left. Was overjoyed at seeing his son back. Had just ordered his hired hands and servants to start preparing for this big celebratory party. To mark the event. And then the older son comes with what he has to say. So, first reaction, the father. Overjoyed at his son who had returned. Second reaction, the older son. 
who had always been there for his dad, who had always been the stable force, who had always been the hard worker. But now his reaction is one of self-centeredness, selfishness, envy, pride, disdain, very cold and unfeeling. But we have a third reaction, I think, that is very important for us to note, an important part of the parable, because it does at least provide uh, a glimmer of hope for the future. And it's the father, again, and the, the reaction that he has to what his oldest son has just said in castigating his joy for seeing the young brother come back. And let's look at that. It's in uh, verse 31 and 32. My son, the father said, you are always with me, and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. The father takes, again, a very gracious and loving approach to one of his sons. His approach to the younger son, who had deserted him, lived a life of sin, squandered everything, came back begging for forgiveness, his approach to him was very, very gracious and loving. He ran to meet him. He embraced him. He ordered a celebration. His reaction to the older son, who had such a bitter reaction to the younger son's return, his younger brother's return, is also extremely gracious and loving. And I think we can focus on three things that he, in essence, says to his oldest son in these two verses. Count your blessings. Enjoy the fact that the presence of God is with us. As he said, you've always been with me. And also celebrate the many presents from God. All that, my, all that is mine is yours. So we have God's presence, certainly encompassed here in his word, and we have his presence. The many, many, many good things that we have because of God. Concede your kinship. The son, the older son, referred to his brother as this son of yours. He didn't call him his brother. He said, this son of yours. Kind of distancing himself from his younger brother. But the father, very rightfully, says, this brother of yours. We're all related We all fall short of the glory of God. We all need God. Now sometimes, all too often, we get to feeling like we don't. Particularly when things are going quite well. And we have good health. And we have material blessings. And we have a loving family. And we have all sorts of things to entertain us and make us feel good. But when things turn differently, we have an illness, we have a loss, we have family members who break our heart, 
We have things going on around us in the world, not only in this country, but other countries. We, we, we say, hmm, it's not going so well. Maybe, maybe I do need God. And that's when we might turn to him. Or, in some cases, we might say, God, what are you doing? Why are you bringing all this suffering and travail upon me? We have the presence of God at all times. And we ought to celebrate that both in good times as well as in bad times. And we need to understand that we are all alien sinners. All of us, every single one of us who were provided with a gift of life through the blood of Jesus Christ. Cultivate your compassion. The Father said we had to celebrate and rejoice. In fact, the original text says it, it was necessary that they celebrate and rejoice the Son's return. And this parable wants the reader and Jesus' intended audience at the time was principally the Sadducees, but he had a larger audience, of course, anybody that read it then and anybody that reads it now. So we're all his audience. But he wanted the Sadducees to understand that they needed to count their blessings. They needed to concede their kinship, that we're all in this together. We all need God. We're all from God. We've all sinned against God. And finally, to cultivate their compassion. Be happy when someone comes back to God. Rejoice. Don't question it. Don't be selfish with God's love. If the older brother had had the right attitude, he would have been sitting at the table enjoying the music and eating prime beef, but instead he was sulking in the dark. He certainly did not seem to have the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, nor self-control. Possessing that fruit in our hearts will help resolve most relationship problems if we will trust God. What happened to the older brother? We do not know. It doesn't tell us. Did he listen to his father ultimately and come into the house and join in the celebration and welcome his younger brother back? Jesus didn't say. It's difficult to change if you are a spiritual older brother and have that attitude. Again, Christ's purpose in this parable was to indict the Pharisees for their attitudes, and most of them did not change. However, a few of them did, most particularly Paul. So there is hope, and that's what we have to hold on to, that hope, and pray about it. We need to park our own pride, our own prejudices, so that we can pray for every soul and rejoice when they return to the Father. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for your inspired word and for the lessons that we can take into our hearts and then into our hands. Father, be with each and every person that is studying your word this day, that they may give you glory and make you happy. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Next week, Lord willing, we will look at the next rest of the story. Story. Thank you.
Good morning. Good morning. It's great to see everyone here this morning. It's wonderful to see and hear the fellowship that's going on. And there will be plenty of time for that after our worship service. We're just so glad to see everybody here today, especially if you're visiting with us. If you're visiting with us, you're welcome uh, to, or uh, glad to and want to welcome you to our worship service here and would ask that if you have an opportunity to stay around a little while after the service is over so we can get to know you a little bit better, we appreciate you coming to worship God with us. Is uh, Jeannie Brockett here this morning? Oh, okay. Jeannie, would you stand, please? Uh, Jeannie has expressed a desire to um, be considered a member of this congregation, and if you're glad to welcome Jeannie as a member of the North MacArthur congregation, please signify by saying amen. 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 We're glad to have you. We had a great Bible class this morning, talked about the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son. If you haven't had an opportunity to take advantage of the Bible classes, we want to encourage you to do that. It's a place where you can grow spiritually. It's time to prepare our mind to worship. And in order to do that, I'd like to read the 100th Psalm. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him, bless his name. For the Lord is good, his steadfast love endures forever and his faithfulness to all generations. Let's pray together. Father, we're so grateful to have this opportunity to gather before you, to worship you, to honor and glorify you. Father, help us to focus on the words of the songs that we will be singing Father, help us to focus on the sacrifice of Jesus when it comes time to partake of the Lord's Supper. Father, help us to focus on the, the, word, uh, the lesson from your word that Tim will bring us. And Father, help each one of us to examine ourselves and uh, help us to make the appropriate response to the message that we receive from the songs and from the communion and from the lesson this morning. It's our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Our first song this morning is number 122 in the books, The Love of God.
Our next song is number 629 in the books, True Hearted, Wholehearted. Next song is number 791 on bended knee. Then following the song, my call will come and direct our minds in prayer. pray. Our mighty Father in heaven, we are so thankful to be here today to gather together to, to worship you and to praise you and to give you honor and glory for being our God and for being so good to us and for creating us. And Father, we just thank you for every blessing that you give us every day. And Father, a big blessing that we have here is the, the truth that's taught at North MacArthur, Father. And 
I'm just thankful for the elders who have the, the vision to each year come up with a topic that we can all work toward and study to, and it's um, universal throughout the congregation that we were all focused on the same thing, Father, and just uh, thankful that they they lead this church in a manner that they are always striving to have us come closer to you, Father. And, and Lord, we're thankful for Tim and his preaching from the pulpit, Father, and um, the way he follows your word and is not ashamed of it and he doesn't add to it, doesn't take away from it, Father. And we're just thankful for Tim and the truth that he preaches. And Father, thank you so much for all the teachers here, for all the little kids, teachers, junior high, high school adults, and bless them for making those quarterly commitments to, to teach your word and to do your will and to please you uh, through this work, Father. Father, we pray for our fast coming uh, Mission Sunday and we pray for all our missionaries around the world that you will bless them, encourage them, and, and uh, watch over them and all that they do, Father. And, Lord, uh, the preacher training camp is coming up uh, next week, and uh, just give all the boys safe travel here and all the instructors who will be coming, but just bless that week, and uh, um, I'm sure lives will be changed. Father, bless us through the rest of this worship time to you. Father, we love you, we thank you, and uh, we pray this in your son's name. Amen. Next song is number 676 in the books, Living for Jesus. This will be sung before we...
1 Corinthians 11, 24 through 26. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We get the part about remembering, but there's a second part that we might overlook. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. The word proclaim means to announce officially or publicly. Do we proclaim Christ in our words, in our actions, in our hearts, in our minds, quite simply in our lives? 1 Peter 2, 9 says, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Just a moment ago, we sang the song, Living for Jesus, and that is not necessarily a song we usually sing before the Lord's Supper, but I really thought it emphasized this idea of proclaiming Christ. There are four verses, we didn't sing the third one, but the four verses talk about living a life that's worthy of Christ. The first verse talks about how Jesus equals a life that is true. Do we really strive to please Christ in all aspects of our lives? Philippians 3.12 says, Not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. The second verse talks about how Jesus died in our place. Romans 5, 6 through 8 says, For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Do we follow his call? Do we give Christ our all? The third verse talks about how we suffer for our faith. 1 Peter 5.10 says, And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. When we suffer in our lives, do we count it a part of our cross? And finally, the fourth verse talks about bringing others to Christ. Matthew 28, 19 through 20 says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Do we think of bringing others to Christ as part of our Lord's Supper? The chorus then states, O Jesus, Lord and Savior, I give myself to thee, for thou in thy atonement didst give thyself for me. I own no other master, my heart shall be thy throne. My life I give, henceforth to live, O Christ, for thee alone. Let's pray together. Father, God, there is no one like your Son, Jesus. Jesus paid the price for us while we were still sinners. He was nailed to the cross on our behalf. Help us to live our lives in such a way that glorifies you. As we eat of the bread, help us to examine our own lives. Forgive us when we fall short. May we proclaim Christ until he comes again. In Jesus' name, amen.
Let's pray again. Heavenly Father, you are the great I am. None can compare to you. We now have eternal life through you. All that Jesus did for us was more than enough that we might spend eternity with you. As we take the cup, help us to focus on the cross and to continue to proclaim it through our lives. Words cannot fully express our thankfulness to you. To God be the glory, in Jesus' name, amen. We often say that the Lord's Supper is concluded. It seems that maybe the worst thing that we could do is to leave the Lord's Supper without giving it a second thought. If we walk away with little reflection and spiritual meditation on what just happened, then we shortchange our own spiritual growth. Giving is a continuation of living a life that is worthy of Christ's example. Let's continue to proclaim our love for Christ in all aspects of our lives. Let's pray together. Father, you have given your everything in your son, Jesus. Help us to willingly give back to you in such a way that continues to proclaim your word until Christ comes again. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Would you all please be standing for this next song, Ancient Words? This has come from the slides only. Out of respect for the reading of God's word, please remain standing following this song as Mark Mercer comes and reads our scripture.
Acts chapter 2, verses 40 through 47 is the reading this morning. I invite you to open your Bibles if you have them handy. Acts chapter 2, verse 40. And with many other words he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all, as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord added to their number, day by day, those who were being saved. Please be seated. What, a, what an exciting reading from God's Word. You want to know who we are and where we came from? Well, that was the description right there. Who, who are we as uh, churches of Christ in 2022? Who are we trying to be? Well, we're trying to be uh, like the people that we read about in Acts chapter 2 when, when the church exploded uh, onto the scene. And what, what a remarkable story. How exciting it is to read about these events. The day of Pentecost, 3,000 in a crowd, a massive crowd of people, and, and they hear the first gospel sermon about the death, burial, and, and resurrection of Jesus, that he died for our sins, that he was buried, that, that the grave couldn't hold him, that, that on the third day he, he sprang back to life, he ascended, he's at the right hand of God interceding for us, and there were 3,000 people that received that message, and those that received the message were baptized, that's Acts 2.41. The number quickly swells to over 5,000, that's Acts 4 and verse 4, 5,000, this fledgling movement of disciples and followers of Jesus Christ that's going to just continue to grow more and more. There's a summary statement. That's really what was being read there from Acts chapter 2. We know that they were continuing steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. Verse 44, they had all things in common. That There were no divisions among them. They all were of the same heart and of the same mind. They believed the same things. They preached and practiced the same things. They enjoyed this daily growth, verse 44, that God was adding to their number daily those who were being saved. And I think we can say by, by all accounts that the church got off to this incredible beginning and appeared to have an optimistic future. But those earliest Christians were in for a disappointment. Long before the first century ended, a great apostasy, a great falling away, a departure was foreseen and foretold. What we're going to do this morning is we're going to trace that departure from the apostles' doctrine. We read they were continuing steadfastly, they were continuing faithfully in, in, the, in the apostles' doctrine. What are we going to look at this morning? Well, I, I want to see what God said would happen. What what, what did God say? Now, I understand that all of these verses uh, come from the Apostle Paul, but, but those of us who understand and believe the Bible believe that Paul spoke as he's carried along by the Holy Spirit. The words aren't Paul's words. The words are God's words. And so, what did God say would happen? I, I want you to hopefully follow along in your Bible. All these passages should be listed on your outline this morning, but 1 Timothy chapter 4. In the first three verses, who's speaking? What's well, the Spirit? The Spirit clearly says that in later times, some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Such teachings come through hypocritical liars whose consciences have been seared as with a hot iron. 
They forbid people to marry and order them to abstain from certain foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. In his second letter to Timothy, in 2 Timothy chapter 4, uh, verses 2 through 4, the the charge to preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season, correct, rebuke, encourage with great patience and careful instruction for the time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Just so you understand, that just means healthy teaching. Men will not put up with healthy teaching. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. Then Paul in Acts 20, 28 through 30 is actually directing these comments to shepherds, to elders in God's church in the city of Ephesus. And he says, keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. Even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. I I want you to understand as we as we study together this morning, why it is so important that we do things God's way in God's church. Because you notice that phrase where where, where he said, be shepherds of the church of God. It belongs to God, not to us. He bought with his own blood. It belongs to him because he built it. It belongs to him because he bought it with his own blood. And in God's church, God ought to get his way. But what is, what is God saying people will do in later times? He said they're going to abandon the faith. The faith once for all delivered to the saints. The faith is a complete system of, of godly you know, behavior, of, of, uh, of how God wants us to live and follow Jesus. The faith once for all people, for all time, for all places, it's been delivered. They're going to depart They're going to abandon the faith. They'll they'll not put up. They won't tolerate healthy teaching. They're going to turn their ears away from the truth. They're hearing the truth, and they're, they're going to turn their ears away. They don't want to hear it anymore. They would rather turn aside. Think about this. Here's the truth. They're going to turn their ears away from the truth, and they're going to turn their ears. They'd rather hear a myth. They'd rather hear a made up story then listen to the truth that comes from God's Word. They're going to distort the truth, and they're going to do that so that they can draw disciples after themselves. I don't want any disciples. No no follower of Jesus Christ should ever want their own disciples. We're trying to make disciples who follow Jesus. Disciples who obey whatsoever Christ has commanded. That's the commission. They're going to distort the truth because they want to draw disciples after themselves. Well, that's what God said would happen. Now I want you to see how it happened. How how the church goes from having unity, having all things in common, being being together, being united in faith and practice. There may be some people that leave this morning and say, that was an anti-Catholic lesson. That's not my intention. My, My intention is to trace the departure from biblical Christianity. That the goal is not to preach against Catholicism, but to explain how people wandered from the truth. How does it start? It starts with hierarchy. It starts with what we would describe as church government or church organization. The first changes arise in the governance of the church, what what manner in which the church is organized. And so the early church is congregational in form. Each 
each local body, like the North MacArthur Church of Christ, each local body is being overseen by elders, served by deacons. If you want to see a summary of that, you can mark down Philippians 1 and verse 1, because as Paul writes to the church in Philippi, he acknowledges they're being shepherded, they're being overseen by elders, and they're being served by deacons. In each congregation where men were qualified, uh, they were ruled by a plurality of elders. That's Titus 1 and verse 5. We're, we're not going to have one elder, a single elder. We're going to have multiple elders in each individual congregation. In time, uh, changes came gradually. The government of the church moved in the direction of a hierarchy. Instead of uh, elders, that's plural, uh, in a congregation, singular, one, one elder exercised dominance in the work. And then it went from a plurality of elders in one congregation to one man shepherding a congregation and eventually one bishop or elder over multiple, over several churches. Until eventually there were five prominent cities where power was extended over all of the churches. These Metropolitan centers were located in Jerusalem, Antioch, Alexandria, Constantinople, and Rome. Here's what's interesting about that. If you ever go back and study it, what you'll find is the shift in the organization away from biblical organization to this new model actually is parallel to the governing structure of the Roman Empire. These developments then are moving rapidly toward the idea of having one head over the church along the lines of having an emperor that ruled over Rome. A man named John the Faster in Constantinople proclaimed himself the universal bishop, but the bishops in Rome opposed that. Ultimately, the bishops of Rome prevail. They designate Boniface III as the first pope. Listen, that happened in 606, if you want to write dates down, 606 AD. The, the church is, is running along for 600 years with, with, with local congregations. With, you've, got, you've got the qualifications for, for elders in 1 Timothy 3, Titus 1. Exactly, We know exactly what they're to be and, and what they're to do. And all of a sudden, now 606 years later, this dramatic shift, a departure from the Apostles' Doctrine. The next thing we see is penance, this infliction of punishment, the subjection of physical pain in order that one might expiate his own sins, thus claim redemption from wrong, wrongdoing. The, the word first uh, comes into, into the vernacular, into the use of the church. 157 years after the establishment of the church, that this idea that you would inflict physical pain to pay for your sin. Listen, it's not, it's not through our works of righteousness that any of us are going to be saved. We cannot suffer or serve or sacrifice enough to save ourselves by ourselves. We're going to be saved by the grace of God. You won't find the idea, the concept, the word penance anywhere in Scripture. Then we see extreme unction when a soul is subject to an impending crisis, immediate danger, either spiritual, physical. The, the, the priest comes and pours oil upon the head and thus prepares him for the ordeal through which he is to pass. It's usually administered to those thought to be in immediate danger of death. It's first announced to mortal man 588, the year 588. You can read from Matthew to Revelation. You can read, we go all the way back to Genesis to Revelation, you're never going to read anything about extreme unction. It's a departure. It's a departure from Scripture. The idea of purgatory. It suggests those who died unprepared, without hope, may be freed from the agonies of torment in which they're, they're, uh, they're writhing in the payment of the priest, the sufficient sum of money. That, there's a phrase, maybe you've heard it, when the, when the coin in the coffer rings the soul from purgatory springs. 593, that marks the date when purgatory is first announced. You're never, you're never going to find purgatory in the Bible. I think some of you have done your reading this week. Maybe you've read about the rich man and Lazarus. Contrary to the idea of purgatory, there's a Hadean realm. 
There's the realm of the dead. There's paradise where Lazarus was. There's torment where the rich man was. And there's a great gulf that separates the two. What, what does Abraham say? Well, when, when the rich man says, could you have Lazarus dip his, his finger in the water and just put a drop of water on my tongue? Abraham says there's a great gulf that separates our side from your side. And even if somebody from, from here wanted to come there or somebody from there wanted to come here, they, they can't. They can't. That, their destiny is set. And, and so not only do we not find this concept in Scripture, we, we find the exact opposite of what is being taught by the doctrine of purgatory. You can't spring someone from torment. That, that, that decision, those choices are made on time's side of eternity. The idea of transubstantiation, that by prayer, the power of the Pope, the bread and the fruit of the vine, mystically change into the literal body, literal blood of the Son of God. And, and no one ever dreamed of such a thing until the year 1,000. A thousand years go by. And, and, the, and the church is assembling as we have this morning, and they're taking the bread, and, and, and they're taking the fruit of the vine to represent the body and the blood of Jesus. And a thousand years later, this doctrine of transubstantiation is introduced, and there isn't anything in the Bible that says that through the prayer of the Pope, it becomes the literal body, that we're eating the literal flesh and drinking the literal blood of Jesus. The idea of celibacy. Doctrine forbids priests to marry. That idea of celibacy did not enter the minds of men until the year uh, 1015, 1015. It's a doctrine that, that actually contradicts Scripture. Because God clearly says in the beginning it is not good. It's not good for the man to be alone. He's looking at his creation and he's, and he's created Adam out of the dust of the ground. And you remember he brings all of the animals by. There's no suitable helper for, for Adam. And he says it's not good for that man to be alone. Later Paul will say this about, about marriage. It's 1 Corinthians 7, 8 and 9. I say to the unmarried, to the widows, it's good for them if they remain even as I am. Paul was celibate. And he said if, if they can do it, it's good for them. It's, it's a good choice to remain as I am. But if they cannot exercise self-control, notice the doctrine of celibacy says, let them not marry. Paul says, let them marry. It's better to marry than to burn with passion. And so what does the Bible say? The Bible says, let them marry. This idea of celibacy is a departure from the truth. What about the sale of indulgences? An individual would pay the priest a sum of money in return. He could th think about how offensive this must be to God. And I know that this is not an ongoing practice, but it was an accepted practice. That, that with, the, with, with a certain sum of money, you could gratify every passion, satisfy every lust, revel in all of the physical appetites that you may desire. And this doctrine was introduced uh, 1,190, 1,190. Would you listen to what the Bible says? This is 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19. And, and the Bible says it's not with perishable things, such as silver and gold, that you've been redeemed from your empty way of life handed down to you by your forefathers, but by the precious blood of Christ, that lamb without spot or defect, you can't write a check big enough. There's not enough silver. There's not enough gold. I can't think of anything more outrageous than the sale of indulgences. Auricular confession. Adherents confess their sins to a human priest. The human priest issues the forgiveness of sins. Confession did not appear until 1215. You're not going to find anything like this in Scripture. You will find that there's one mediator between man and God, the man, Christ Jesus. We don't have to go through a human priest to get to God. Jesus is our great high priest. Jesus is all we need. 
And we can with boldness and confidence approach that throne of grace through the mediator, the man, the God who became man, the the, the one who's the perfect representation of God to man and of man to God, the one who is perfectly suited in every way to represent us in matters pertaining to God. Yes, we can confess our sins one to another. We can pray for one another. The prayers of a righteous man availeth much. But as we confess our sins and we pray, uh, there isn't any, any individual here or anywhere else that has the power to offer us the forgiveness that can only be found through Jesus Christ. What about sprinkling for baptism? Uh, a practice that was used since 251 for sickness on special occasions. I think it's been referred to as clinical baptism. Someone's too sick to get out of bed, and so they sprinkle water on them. It was adopted as a regular pra- practice in 1311. What we understand from Scripture that baptism is an immersion. The word itself means to immerse, to bury, to dip, to submerge, to overwhelm. And, and even as we look to Scripture, as, as the act of baptism is being described in Romans chapter 6, we, we are buried. Those who were baptized into Christ are buried with Him and raised with Him. It's not a sprinkling, it's not a pouring. It's a burial. It's an immersion. Now, these are not the only departures. But they're representative of what it looked like to depart from the apostles' doctrine. Here's the question next. Why did that happen? God said that there would be people who would no longer hold to healthy teaching. They would turn their ears away from the truth. They would would turn aside to myths. How could that happen? Why did it happen? I want to suggest that it happened in part because people didn't follow the pattern. There are people today that are departing from biblical Christianity for the, for the same reason that all these other examples that we listed, they, some don't even know that there is a pattern. And I'm not saying that in an arrogant way. I, I'm not trying to be condescending. I, I think there are very genuine people who want to do what pleases God, but they don't know that there's actually a pattern. Do you know why Paul wrote to Timothy in the first place? In, in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 and 15, He said, I I hope to come to you soon. I'm writing you these instructions so that if I'm delayed, listen, you will know how people ought to conduct themselves in God's household, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the foundation of the truth. The the household is the church. He's he's saying there's a code of conduct. There's, There's a way that people that are part of God's household, that are part of the church that that belongs to God, there's a way that they ought to conduct themselves. There's a pattern. We see this in his second letter, in 2 Timothy 1 and verse 13. He says, what you heard from me, keep as the pattern of sound teaching with faith and love in Christ Jesus. When we stop following the pattern, when we no longer look to the inspired word that God has given us to to understand, to guide, and yes, to govern how we conduct ourselves in His house, in His church, we're going to drift. We're going to get out of what God wants us to be into, and we're going, to, we're going to get into all kinds of stuff that never even entered his imagination. They did not follow the pattern, and they did not adhere to the principle. So what's the principle? It's a biblical principle. It's a principle of how we handle the truth that God has given to us. And and you'll see it all the way back in the book of Deuteronomy. I I didn't give you all of these passages, but you'll see it again in the book of Proverbs. You'll see it in the last 
two verses of the New Testament at the very end of, uh, uh, you know, of the book of Revelation. What is, what is the principle that we're talking about this morning? Well, in Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 2, do not add to what I command you and do not subtract from it, but keep the commands of the Lord your God that I give you. What should we do with commands when God gives us commands? He says, well, you don't add to them and you don't take away from them. You just keep those commands. And if God says that he wants us to do something, then that's what we do and we don't add to it and we don't take away from it and we don't rationalize. We don't, we don't justify. Well, I, you know, now look, that the Bible doesn't say that we shouldn't do this. No, but the Bible says what we should do. And instead of adding to what, what God has said, we should just keep the commands as he's given them to us. And then in that same book in chapter 12, verse 32, see that you do all I command you. Is it important that we do everything? Do you understand when Jesus gives the Great Commission at the end, you know, Matthew 28 and the final verses, it, that ends with teaching them to obey whatsoever I've commanded you. And, and that's a biblical principle. It's how we handle the truth that God has given us. Do all I command you, do not add to it or take away from it. How was it possible? For God's called out people, people who are purchased by the blood of Jesus to wander so far away from, from that faith, that system of belief that was handed to them by, by the apostles. Now listen, why continue in the apostles' doctrine? Because the apostles are inspired by the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit didn't make it up. The Holy Spirit received the message from Jesus, and Jesus didn't make it up. Jesus said, I don't speak on my own authority. He, he made it clear that he only spoke what the Father commanded him. There's a chain of command. God gives his will and his word to Jesus. Jesus gave it to the Spirit. The Spirit passes it along to the apostles. We listen to the apostles, not, not because of what Peter or Paul said but because that message came from god now how did we get so far away well that happens because we don't follow the pattern we don't adhere to the principle for for bible interpretation and and that same thing continues to happen to people today when, when we take away when we add to here's a here's another thought this comes from the apostle paul for how to be careful that that what has happened to others doesn't happen to us. 1 Corinthians 4, 6. Brothers, I've applied these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit so that you may learn from us the meaning of the saying. Listen to it. Do not go beyond. Do not go beyond what is written. Then you will not take pride in one man over and against another. I want you to think about a few things as we conclude. Why is there not an instrument here? And why don't we use an instrument when we worship God? Why don't we ask people to say the sinner's prayer or to invite Jesus to, to enter their hearts? There are a lot of intelligent and articulate and talented, gifted women in this church family. Why don't we ask them to preach? And why don't we ask them to teach the adult Bible classes or to serve as elders or to serve as deacons? And why don't we have a, a central headquarters for the churches of Christ? And why do we practice uh, the idea of independence or autonomy at the local level and have a plurality of elders that oversee the work that's being done? Well, the answer is simple. Because we've made the foundational commitment not to go beyond what's written. We're striving to do Bible things in Bible ways, to call Bible things by Bible names. We're seeking to the best of our ability, not, not perfectly, but to the best of our ability faithfully to understand and to teach and to practice the pattern of sound teaching that's given to us by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And what could be wrong with that? What, what could be wrong with saying that we want to know what the Bible 
teaches, and we want to limit what we do. We want to limit our faith and practice to the guidance of God's Word. I know there are people that say, well, I'll tell you what's wrong with that, Tim. It's judgmental, and it's legalistic. But there's nothing legalistic about wanting to please God. There, there isn't anything legalistic about wanting to know what God wants and doing our best to give that to Him. We want to approach Him in the ways that please Him. We're not trying to substitute our preferences for God's will. I don't know what could be more pleasing to God or what could be more central to Christianity than submitting to the Lordship of Jesus Christ and letting Him have His way in our lives. I want to ask you this morning, have you followed God's plan for salvation? When we talk about hearing, believing, repenting, confessing, and being baptized, why do we say that? Well, because passages like Romans 10, 17, they say that faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. So we have to hear, because you can't have faith without hearing the Word of God. You've got to have the Word of God. Well, then you have to believe. We could go to John 3, 16, or John 5, 24, John 8, 24. All those verses talk about how important it is that we believe in Jesus Christ as the Son of God if we want to have eternal life, if, if we want to cross from death to life, if we don't want to be condemned. We have to believe. We have to repent. Luke 13, 3 and 5, except you repent, you'll perish. God commands all men everywhere to repent. What about confession? Well, Romans 10, 9 and 10, you have to confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord, and then you'll be saved. Baptism is throughout the New Testament. Jesus said, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. Whoever does not believe will be condemned. I wish there would be one more thing on there. Remain faithful. Remain faithful. Walk in the light as He is in the light, and the blood of Jesus will continually cleanse you of all your sin. As we look to the Word as our guide, are you following? Can you you look at your life honestly and hold up the pattern? Just hold up the pattern and look at your life. Compare your life with the pattern that God has given. And if something doesn't match, listen, we don't change the pattern to match our lives. We change our lives to match the pattern. Not so that we can boast in our self-righteousness, but so that we can please God by giving God what He wants. I wonder if you want to do that with your life. If there's somebody here this morning who's thinking, "That, that sounds good to me. I want my life to please God. I want to do what God wants because I love Him, because I want to serve Him. Communion's a powerful thing. It's one of the the most convicting, almost confrontational experiences that we have in worship. We're We're confronted with this truth. He gave Himself for me. He gave Himself for me. And now you have an opportunity to give yourself back to Him. If you want to do it, would you come as we stand and sing?
Please be seated. I'd like to invite you back this evening at five o'clock. Tim will be teaching a lesson on if we've strayed from Christ, how can we be restored to him? This morning we learned about how to come to Christ. This evening we can learn about what we need to do if we've come to Christ, fallen away, and now we need to be, uh, be restored. So if you can come back, please be back with us at five o'clock this afternoon. Well, thank you for your presence here this morning. We uh, appreciate those of you who may be visiting with us. If you are visiting, please don't run off. Uh, please let us get to know you a little bit better. If you're joining us online, thank you for doing so. We look forward to uh, having you here with us. And if you are visiting with us online, please know that anytime you're in the area, you're certainly welcome to join us. Uh, if you would like to respond to that invitation this morning, um, you can always reach the elders at their address, elders at northmac.org. If you've not uh, done so already, please don't forget to check in using your apps or you can use the kiosk, um, the, the iPad kiosks on the north information table. Uh, just a couple of announcements this morning. Uh, this is a reminder that there's a new widows and widowers, widowers group. Uh, they'll be having their first meeting this coming Tuesday, July 19th. Uh, at 6 in the small auditorium here at North MacArthur. If you have any questions about that, please see Joan Little. Uh, she'll be able to direct you. And also, we found out uh, that David Dill is going to be having triple bypass. Uh, that's been scheduled for July 26th, and that's going to be at Baptist. So please keep David in your prayers um, as he prepares for that surgery. Number 852 is our closing song this morning. And if you will, please be standing for this song and then remain standing for our closing prayer. Austin McNeely will dismiss us in that prayer. When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound, the time shall be war, and the morning breaks eternal bright and fair. When the Savior shall gather over on the other shore, and the road is solid on the road there. When the God, we just want to thank you for this day you've given us to uh, just come here and uh, worship you and uh, spend time with one another uh, in your word. And uh, we just ask you to uh, be with us in this upcoming week and uh, help us to be shining lights for you uh, in the world, God. And we just ask you to uh, uh, strive hard to follow that pattern you've set forth for us in your word and um, to always remain near to that, no matter what the world brings towards us. Uh, we just ask you to be with those who are uh, sick and unable to be with us, and um, those that are needing your care at this time. Thank you for your son, Jesus, who died on the cross for our sins. And it's his name we pray. Amen. <laughs>